Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Grout. I'll be talking about interactive computing with Jupyter. Um, just a little bit about me first. Uh, I finished my PhD in mathematics at BYU in 2007. I was a postdoc at Iowa State for two years after that, and I, start, and I got uh, really involved with the Sage Math project. So, how many people have heard about Sage Math? Okay, so it's an open source mathematical software system, uh, and it has uh, quite a few mathematics. Uh, mathematic capabilities. It also has an online notebook. I started working a lot with the online notebook. Uh, I went to Drake University and was a professor in mathematics there for a few years and continued working heavily with the Sage crowd. And then a few years ago, I uh, decided to jump in and make a transition to industry. Um, I'm wor now working at Bloomberg and I've been working on IPython and Jupyter ever since I started at Bloomberg. Um, feel free to interrupt me anytime you have a question. I consider this sort of an informal setting, so uh, feel free to ask questions. Um, but first, a poll. How many people have used Python, IPython, or Jupyter? Oh, good, fantastic. So that's almost everybody in the room. How many people have used IPython or Jupyter, IPython or Jupyter with a language other than Python? Okay, just a few people. How many people knew you could do that? Okay, a few more, <laughs> good. <laughs> How many people have used IPython or Jupyter with the web-based notebook? Okay, a few more. How many people have used the interactive widgets in the notebook? Okay, great. I think we'll have a lot of fun stuff to talk about then. Um, just a brief history about the IPython Jupyter project. Uh, in November 2001, Fernando Perez, this, this guy right here, uh, he uh, told his PhD advisor to do an afternoon hack to try to make uh, Python a little more usable. He wrote a 260 line or so Python script that made Python a little more usable, basically just changed the input and output prompt, automatically imported plotting and things like that. He says it's his, it was his PhD procrastination project. We all have those sorts of things. Um, it turned into a, a much bigger project. As of uh, 2014, we have a huge number of commits, nearly 500 contributors, tons of lines, a number of different languages, including HTML, JavaScript, Python, etc. Um, the project was getting huge, and we realized that it would be better to refactor the project uh, to better serve the needs that we were going after. And so 2015 became the year of the big split. And so instead of a humongous project, we split the project up into dozens of different repos, and, and they're still, still counting. Um, what IPython, or Jupyter, uh, bring to us is thinking about the REPL, the read evaluate, uh, read eval print uh, loop, as a network protocol. So we're going to separate uh, the typical interaction we have with the computer into what happens in the browser, or what happens in the client, and what happens in the server. Yeah, question. Sorry, uh, you, you just keep referring to IPython as kind of slash Jupyter. Yes. I don't Next slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, we'll talk about how IPython and Jupyter are related to each other. For now, just think of them as the same sort of thing. Um, it's largely overlapped uh, developers and efforts. Um, we think of, we, we decided to take, so the original idea from Fernando, and then as it's grown, um, is to take the idea of this read value uh, print uh, loop and separate it into what happens in the back end the kernels, the actual execution of the code, and what happens in the front end. Uh, this is the typing the code in, getting completions, and all sorts of stuff. Um, and separate those out and think of it as a network protocol. And then we can plug in new kernels on the back end and plug in new front ends on the front end. And we have a, a really rich uh, ecosystem of clients both executing code and interacting with the code on the front end. And one particular one, uh, front end that's, that's been used quite a bit is the Jupyter Notebook, or the IPython Notebook. Um, we have a picture here on the, on the side. Um, it gives us uh, text and math. It gives us code. It gives us results. So here's some code. There's results from the code. There's interspersed text. Um, this isn't the only notebook that's been out there. Sage uh, has had a notebook for a long time. Uh, Mathematica has a notebook type environment. Maple has a notebook type of environment. Um, this is a pretty common sort of uh, way of interacting with code and explanation. All right, so we have this huge project that was trying to help uh, people 
better compute and better uh, work with their, their computations and realized that a lot of the project really didn't have anything to do with Python. It was sort of language agnostic. And so this is the year of the big split, 2015, where we took the language agnostic parts of the project and called them Jupyter. So this is things like the network protocol for uh, the computations, the clients, so this is the, how you interact with what the code that's actually running. So this is a web front end or a console, um, the file format, uh, a multi-user server, uh, and various other projects. These are really have nothing to do with Python, and so we separated those out so that they could be used really with any language. And then we have a reference backend. This is the Python part, uh, a reference backend for the computation. And so in the past, all of this has been IPython. Now, the language agnostic parts are Jupyter. The language specific parts for Python are called IPython. Does this answer your question? Okay. So why Jupyter? Well, there's something in the name. Um, one, it pays homage to the big, three of the big data science languages, Julia, Python, and R. Um, and even more than that, it pays homage to Galileo's uh, original paper on discovering the moons of Jupiter, which is one of the early examples of open science computation. You read this paper and half the paper is him explaining and drawing out his data and explaining how he came to his conclusions. And this is one of the things that we really want to do with Jupiter uh, and IPython. From now on, I'll just say Jupiter and IPython. You can think of it as a, one of the projects inside of the Jupiter ecosystem. Um, one of the things we wanted to do with Jupiter is make it easy and, and really encourage people to share their data, share their code, and make it so that other people can reproduce the results and learn from them. Okay, so there's a lot of technical details, but let's take a step back and ask, why Jupiter? Here's a quote from uh, Richard Hamming that I really, really like. The purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. Um, a lot of times, as I'm doing computing or as I'm working on code, I, I get so wrapped up in the actual numbers and the code and everything that I forget the whole point is not the numbers, but what we gain from it. In a sense, you can say that the thing that we're after is the story that we're telling the people that are uh, being impacted by the computation, not necessarily the numbers or the systems or the comp uh, computational tools themselves. Um, often I find myself, uh, you know, the computer, purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. It's also not tooling. I find myself, uh, like Randall Moreau explained, Monroe explained here, every now and then I realize I'm maintaining a huge chain of technology solely to support itself. When I think of all the Git and the shell scripts and the, you know, other Python scripts and the tools that I'm using, a vast ecosystem of things, but really, uh, it's insight that I'm after here, and this is what we're really trying to help people uh, to, to go after. I want to split insight into two different parts here, though. Um, first is gaining insight. Um, what do we want from our tools in order to better gain insight from our computations? And one of the things I'd like to focus on today is what we want from our tools is to get rid of this big problem, friction. Friction is the resistance to movement. And friction distracts focus, and if you've ever been hiking the Appalachian Trail or anything, you realize friction also causes blisters, real pain points. Um, two big areas I've noticed in my life that cause friction are context switches, and in particular context switches where I'm switching uh, between tool chains. So I'm working in Git over here, then I switch to Mercurial over here, then I switch to copying files over here. Or I'm working in Python over here, and then I have to move to Excel, or I'm working in LaTeX, and then I have to move to Python, et cetera, switching contexts, either for different activities or, or different phases of the same activity, introduces some friction and, and distracts me from the, the insight that I'm trying to achieve. Another type of friction that I see in my life is when I'm doing computation is this friction between going between high-level uh, activities and low-level activities. I have a high-level idea that I want to explore, but then before I can explore that idea, I have to go type out 10 pages of code. And by the time I finish the 10 pages of code and then debugging it and whatever, I forgot the high-level idea. And this switching between a high-level context and a low-level context 
uh, introduces some friction in this process of just gaining insight from the computation. And these two things uh, Jupyter can really help with. So we want our tools to reduce friction in order to help us better gain insight. All right, let me do a short demo here. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Jupyter is uh, uh, language agnostic. There's, there's plenty of front ends. There's something like 40 to 50 language kernels on the back end. So we have a front end that lets us interact with things and it's sending our code to the back end, a kernel that's actually doing the execution. And Python is sort of the reference kernel. It's the kernel that uh, uh, Jupyter started with. Uh, but there's 40 to 50 other languages that have been doing, uh, have been making kernels. And uh, I just want to illustrate how many people have heard of Julia? Okay, how many people have heard of Rust? We had a great talk earlier about Rust and C, of course, I hope everybody's heard of. Yeah, so, so one of the things that Jupyter Notebook allows us to do is to easily, uh, maybe start this notebook, easily switch between the languages. So here I'm, uh, I'm in a, a web notebook here. So this is running on my local computer, but it could be running remotely. And I'm going to load uh, a Julia magic. And what this allows me to do is to actually execute some Julia code. Now what this Julia code here is doing is it's importing some Python stuff. So I'm using Julia to talk to Python here. And the second cell, this percent percent Julia means this, this cell right here, this is Julia code. But actually this Julia code is using the Julia function lens space, but the NumPy, the Python function cosine, the Julia function sine, the Python PLT, and assigning it to a variable and then outputting a display. So it lets us very easily interact and move between different languages. This is part of reducing that friction between tool sets. Um, in fact, you can say, well, here what we're doing is we're getting the Julia variable fig and putting it in the Python side and then modifying it a little bit. So this is creating a graph. And you could even say we could go back and forth because once we can call Python from Julia and Julia from Python, then we could write a function that's a Julia function that calls a Python function and then we could write a Python function that calls a Julia function and calculate a Fibonacci number. Now every time you see a P, we're in Python and every time you see a J, we're in Julia as we go down the stack. So it's very easy to switch back and forth between the two ecosystems here. Question? Is there a reason you do that other than it's cool? Well, this is because it's so fun. <laughs> and to illustrate the point that it's very easy to flip back and forth between the tool sets here. Um, it is, there is a good reason for doing this. If you're in Julia, there's a, Julia has a nice up and coming ecosystem of tools and things like that, but there's a lot that's still missing. And a lot of times they punt and say, uh, go use Matplotlib, go use the Python stuff. And, uh, and you can use it all from the notebook here. In fact, you can go even further. Here we'll load a C uh, magic and we'll define a function in C. This function in C is going to take a Python 8 and uh, compute the triplet in C. And then we might as well throw Rust in the mix here. So here we'll write a Rust function that doubles the number. And then, you know, we might as well uh, combine the Rust in C. So this is taking a, a Python 3 and sending it into the rest doubling function, taking the output of that and sending it into the C tripling function and then printing the result back out in our client. And I mean, you might as well do it all. Here we have a Python 5 that's being sent into a Fibonacci function that's flipping back and forth between Python and Julia and then we're taking that and sending it into rest and C and computing the result. Very frictionless, you see. In fact, I mean, you could even go one further than that and say, well, you know, I can introduce JavaScript into the mix here. Okay, so now I have JavaScript that's, that's writing a number that's being converted to Python, that's being converted to Julia in Python, and it's uh, then going into the REST function, or the C function. Again, very little friction between all these different kernels, all these different backends. Not a bunch of compile this, now take the output of that and send it to this, and now figure out how to compile this and match the two up, et cetera. Um, another example that addresses the second thing of friction that I mentioned, um, that is switching between high level and low level activities. Um, suppose, I, I'm gonna take a really simple example so that the concept becomes really clear here. In this example, I just wanna understand what the square function is doing. 
easy enough, right? My, my nine-year-old daughter might have fun with this as a, as a real math problem. For us, we'll see that as a concept. Um, you know, I might say print two plus two, print th three plus three, okay, that's nine, print four plus four, and you can already see I, I'm thinking a lot faster than I'm typing. And this jumping down to the typing level is introducing some friction here. Well, I can help the typing just a little bit by defining a function, right? Then I only have to change one number here. F of two, F of three looks like this, F of four looks like this, but you can see already that this is getting boring. Um, again, I'm thinking a lot faster than I'm typing. What's happening is I'm thinking here, I type in the code, it's getting sent to the Jupyter Notebook, it's getting executed into the Python kernel. The Python kernel sending back the output to the Jupyter Notebook, which is being printed to me. And if you look, where is the slow part in this loop? This part's extremely fast. The thinking part, well, I mean, we'll leave as much time as we want thinking. The, this, the slow part is this part right here, the typing part. So can we reduce that friction? Can we reduce that context switch between high level and low level? And the answer is yes, we've made a very simple way to do this. Um, now I can type things a lot faster. So what this is, is it's a function that automatically creates a slider that represents the value of x. And then as I change the slider, it's going to feed that value into the function f and automatically display. So now, in a sense, I'm computing as fast as I can think instead of as fast as I can type. And that's really powerful. Um, you might say, well, I don't want to do negative numbers. So we can say, well, we want uh, x to be between 0 and 100. So here we're, can, can everyone see this? If I make it a little bit bigger, does that help? So, so I can specify a two bounds, or if I want to go uh, all the way, I can say uh, I want to create an int slider, so an integer slider with a min of zero, a max of 500, a value of 10, and a step of two. So I could get as specific as I want. And you know, there's a lot of JavaScript code being written behind the scenes here, um, but the idea is I don't have to worry about that. I just specify what I want, and then I can just compute and do things as fast as I can think. Um, this can be a lot more powerful. Here's an example where I've taken a few uh, different controls. So the title is, uh, is obviously string, so I need something to edit strings. Power uh, is uh, 0 to 10, so I'll take a slider between 0 and 10. Uh, graph equals true, so that's clearly a checkbox, some kind of Boolean. Uh, color, there's three different colors, so I'll put that in a drop down, and it's all automatically computing uh, these controls for you, and then you can change your plot. So maybe I like it green, maybe I like revenue like this, or even better, I like profit like that, and now I have the graph for my boss. This is great. Um, easily, easily, easily doing this loop back and forth of the computation um, automatically. So we call these widgets, um, and this automatic creation of widgets we call interact. Um, so uh, Sage has had uh, interact as a precursor to this. Uh, Mathematica has some sort of uh, controls uh, like this, and other systems, uh, InThought has had controls like this, but this really makes things powerful. In fact, I can go one step further. Um, here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a slider that's the maximum value of n, create another slider for n, and I'm gonna link the maximum value of n's value with the n's maximum. And so in one step, what I've done is now I've uh, linked these two controls together. So what you'll see here is the max of the n is 16, but if I move max n up, now the max of n is 51. So I've, in one step, I've linked these two controls together, and then I've said uh, any time n's value changes, so observe the value of n, call this function, and this function is printing it out. So here I see again the square. So very easy to not only create these controls, but hook them together. Question? If you were to reduce max n to 15 there, would it be automatically? Yeah. Yes, I hope so, right? <laughs> yeah. So automatically helps with the, the balance of the values. All right, things can get a little more complex, though. Um, one of the things that we've done at Bloomberg is we've really gone crazy with this. 
um, this idea of these interactive widgets. Yeah, question. Actually, just uh, uh, like the previous example, we're able to uh, compose those things, that max n and n, make another component out of it? Um, yeah. Yep. Um, you can compose them on the Python side. So just write a function that will output a box with those two things. And we've got an H box and a V box to help you lay things out. And a lot of people have been going really crazy with this as well um, to create whole UIs uh, full of these controls. And then write a function that will just create that UI for you. Yeah, one of the easiest ways to write a simple UI to explore an idea. Question? Do you use like um, Pyplot or Matplotlib in here to do yeah, this is PyPlot right here. This is Matplotlib. So, yes. And in fact, Matplotlib has been doing, uh, the question is, can you use Matplotlib? We've, we showed an example here, and they've been doing a lot more stuff with uh, making the interactivity work a lot better, too. So being able to click on the graph, et cetera. Um, but talking about plotting, one of the things that we did at Bloomberg is we realized that, that there's, there's a lot of really cool things that you can do once you can easily make these interactive controls. And so we wrote an entire plotting library uh, based on this idea of these interactive controls. So this is developed by the Bloomberg uh, Quant Finance Research Team, headed by Bruno De Pere, and, and the main contributors to this library are listed here. Um, the idea is we want a nice plotting library. I'll give you an example. Here's, here's a plot. Um, it's not too much different than matplotlib. Plot, here's some x data, y data, Here's some options for the axes, and we get a plot here. Um, we've got typical interaction like dragging around, zooming, et cetera. You can save the value of the plot uh, as a PNG, and we can reset the, the uh, viewport. Um, and you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. So for example, we'd like interaction. So here I'm uh, creating a brush int selector. This just adds a level of interaction to this chart so that I can select it. Now what happens when I select it though is every time this selection changes, a notification is sent back to Python saying, hey, my new selection is this value right here. And then what I'm doing here is I'm just printing out the value. But you can imagine what you, instead you could be uh, changing another value somewhere else or running a computation or running a computation then displaying the result of that computation. And so all of a sudden you have a, a lot more rich, a, a rich, a much richer way of getting input from the user here. So we have a variety of different plots. Here we have a scatter plot. Um, we, we have a high level API. It's a matplotlib type of matplotlib pyplot API. We also have a lower level API where you actually are using grammar of graphics type of uh, constructs. Construct the scale and axis and then you make a scatter plot with these particular scales and axes, and this lets you build much more complex plots. Um, but the, again, the idea is any one of these plots, every single attribute of this, uh, it's possible to change, uh, either on the client side, on the browser, or on the Python side. So here I'm gonna change the rotation of all the scatter plots and change the color really easily. Um, I can interact with things. Here's a scatter plot. Now I mentioned before that some of these interactions, every time I interact with something, it's sent to the Python side. What I'm doing here is I'm, as I'm changing uh, a value in the scatter plot by dragging it, uh, the value is being sent to the Python side, the means computed. This control up here is updated with the current mean and the line is adjusted to be the current mean. So I get instant feedback here with the plotting as I'm dragging it around. You can see this is the sort of thing that would be really time consuming to actually go back into the data, change a piece of data, replot it, find the new mean, change another piece of data, replot it, find a new mean, versus just dragging it around. Did I say change the data to other things? Yes. It is, what, so, so when we made the data, uh, when we gave it the data, uh, we gave it uh, a list here, a copy of a list, and so it's changing the copy of the list. Um, but we can get out that copy of the list from the scatter if we wanted as well. But it is actually changing a list of data on the Python side. Um, we have a lot more interactions. So for example, 
Here I've got a plot. This is a lot more complicated plot. It's got a couple of different uh, values. And uh, of course I can select like I did before. And again, as I select, the uh, values that I'm selecting are sent back to Python and I'm printing them out up here, but I could do whatever else I wanted with. I could affect something else. Um, I could also just select a single value. And you can see here as I'm selecting a single value, the date time that uh, is being selected is being sent back to Python. And I can act on it there. Um, I have a very quick uh, selector that lets me very quickly brush over areas. Uh, and then, like the scatter plot, I could change the data. Here I can change the data as well. Yeah, I like this graph a lot better. There you go. You have to be careful when some of this stuff is uh, sensitive data. You don't want to change the forecast for your company or something like this. But it allows you to really uh, uh, explore different what-if scenarios. All right, let's see, it looks like Chrome froze up. There we go. Oh, wow. Let me kill my web server and uh, looks like something froze up here. When you're starting a web server, are you still starting with iPython notebook? Now a different. Yeah, good question. Um, you start it with Jupyter Notebook. So a lot of the language agnostics things have moved over to the Jupyter uh, command. Um, so this would be Jupyter Notebook. All right. So on the server, uh -huh. question. So if you wanted to run this for a large set of users, so let's say you wanted to you know, run this <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, what do you do if you have a ton of users and you want to supply them? Um, so, I mean, you can't get around, you need computation resources for people um, in that sort of situation. There are some people that are running some public facing uh, servers that allow you to do computation. So if you go to try.jupyter.org, for example, it pops up a notebook that anybody can use. Um, if tons of people start using it and start using it to, I don't know, mine bitcoins or something like that, likely the service will be shut down. Um, but it's certainly possible to do, and people have been running thousands of uh, thousand user servers uh, to support classes. Like the entire, uh, like a large portion of the campus of UC Berkeley, uh, there's a there's a course that's being run uh, that involves hundreds, if not thousands, of students that uh, runs from a, a server there. In the same thought, like if you have hundreds of thousands of students running at Berkeley, you clearly have like everybody. Yeah, good question. I think so. The question is how are how are resources partitioned out, and and how do you work login and security and authentication? Uh, there's a project called Jupyter Hub uh, that is trying to address this, and other people have other projects to do this sort of thing as well. Um, but the sky's the limit. Um, we've tried to make it really extensible how how you can uh, apportion out resources or send people to some, some computers, other people to other computers. So it's configurable. That's a good answer. How do you, um, if, if you need to, for example, want to set up for a semi-public server like that, uh, how do you, would you disable uh, bang or percent percent bash? Yeah, okay, so the, so the question is security. How do, you, how do you get security when you're running a server like this for other people? Um, so the, the interesting thing is, is that the primary feature of this platform is arbitrary code execution. So, so security becomes a bit of an issue. Um, 
this becomes an issue of how you set up your server. Um, and, and, and there's lots of people here that have been talking about security and things like that. And it's, a, and it's an issue that, that is totally doable if you know how to do it in, in a context of some, them logging into a server. Um, it, it's difficult, though, because we want them to execute arbitrary code. That's the whole point. Yep. Um, here's another example, uh, a little more uh, applicable example, or a little more real life example. So here we're making what we call a market map, and uh, using just you know a few lines of code, uh, we've taken the GDP and uh, made it so that we have a tooltip anytime we hover over something, and it shows us the G GDP of that country. Um, we can. Again, adjust attributes in real time. Uh, let's see, there we are. So we can adjust the colors, for example, to, re to reflect the GDP. And I can easily see, ah, USA is a little, you know, 50, 54,600 and whatever units there are. And this is colored a little bit lighter. There's a color map here. Or we can even go a little bit crazier and say, well, we actually want to see the entire graphs of the GDP inside of a tooltip. So we can easily compose these widgets and make uh, the interactivity even more fun. <coughs> so this is an open source library. You can check it out on GitHub called BQplot. Um, and we've, we've done a lot of nice things to help the interactivity of users. Yeah, so, so Jupyter provides the container here. The question is, what visualization, how do we do visualization in Jupyter? Um, Jupyter provides the container, the web notebook, and other packages provide the visualization. So Matplotlib provides visualization, BQplot provides a visualization, BQplot's written on top of D3. Um, Boca is another plotting library, Plotly is another plotting library, so there's a number of plotting libraries uh, that are separate packages that you install into the Jupyter Notebook and then provide uh, the plotting. Sorry, just to follow up. Um, just, so any uh, limitation in terms of the amount of data that needs to be visualized is going to be a factor of the, the body library of Jupyter? Uh, so the question is limitations of the, of the visualization. Yeah, uh, yeah, or the browser. Um, so we've had examples where we're, in fact, we'll see an example where we're loading a pretty large data set, and when we had a larger data set, it crashed the browser because the memory usage was too high in JavaScript side. Um, there's lots of ways to, to mitigate this, downsampling the data on the server, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, these are problems that we can't solve for you uh, when you're dealing with large data sets. I was wondering, um, do you support uh, high stocks or high charts? Really, they have a, like high stock is their library there for stock stuff and uh, Google charts and that kind of thing. Yeah. So BQplot uh, question about stocks. So BQplot I think has a high look lows chart. Um, and specifically, high charts is like a, it's like a company added. Oh, you're talking about a specific charting company. Um, I don't know if they have a Jupyter uh, plugin okay. that works. Good question. Um, here's an example, a little more real life example. This is from Daniel Lamb, uh, who's a, a member of the quant finance research team at, at Bloomberg. And he did a, we've, we've done a number of interesting uh, studies. And you'll notice here, uh, one of the things about Jupyter is it allows you to have the computation, but also the code and explanation in between the computation. So he talks a little bit about uh, what this example is showing. And then gives us an example. The idea is, uh, Often we have two variables and they're correlated with each other, but we don't know how they're correlated. So you have, for example, in the finance world, you have two stocks and you think they're probably correlated. You're not sure how they're correlated, so you take some samples and you want to see from the samples if you can guess what the true correlation is. So here's an example where we have a plot. And again, because the plot, BQ plot here, because the BQ plot library is built on top of widgets, it's very easy to hook the BQ plot library with any other widgets. And so we have the BQplot library uh, drawing a graph of a circle here, and we have those sliders that we saw earlier, and it's very easy to hook these two together so that when you change the slider, it's updating the plot. 
And so what we're doing here is we're affecting the correlation between the two variables, and then we're going to take some samples and, and, and try to understand what the correlation is between these two variables. So we're trying to, so we do principal component analysis and, and some math and try to guess uh, the correlation between these two variables. And you can see with a small number of samples, so what I'm doing as I'm, as I'm, as I'm dragging the slider is basically running some simulations, uh, taking some samples and trying to guess what the correlation is between these two variables. And when the, when the correlation is quite high, so a very uh, elongated ellipse, it doesn't take very many samples for us to uh, be able to guess what the correlation is. But when the correlation is very low, then you'll notice that it takes a while for us to converge down to the, to the uh, true correlation. And so this just, again, provides a way for us to interactively play with uh, a situation and try to get our mind around it, try to gain insight from it, without having to go back and type a few numbers and then run a computation, then compare that to what the computation was before, and then type a few more numbers, run another computation, and try to compare that with the computation. Instead, I can just play with the data and, and, and sort of interactively see what's going on. Um, there's, uh, uh, we can also look at uh, if we take uh, variables that are correlated to each other and we, we plot the true correlation for a lot of different samples and the sample correlation. Um, so the sample correlation is a correlation we get from a, a, a taking some samples. True correlation is from uh, how we're taking those samples, so the true distributions we're taking those samples from. And again, you'll notice that as the sample size is small, when the correlation is high or low, when the variables are really correlated with each other, the sample size converges quickly to the right correlation. But when the correlation is in the middle, so zero correlation independently, uh, identical independent uh, distribution, the sample correlation really uh, is all over the place. And again, we can play with this very easily to see that uh, at the ends, we end up getting quickly to a, a, the right correlation. And if we get uh, a large sample, then of course the, all the samples tend to converge towards the true correlation. So again, the idea here is to gain insight not worry so much about the tools and the computation. And this interactive plotting and the interactive tools we have here allow us to quickly get to the gaining insight part rather than messing around a lot with the computation and typing numbers and things like that. Um, here's another example. Uh, we, uh, one of the nice things is that browsers have become increasingly sophisticated over the last few years. Uh, recently, browsers introduced a, uh, an OpenGL, so a 3D plotting API. And so some students and I at Drake University wrote uh, a wrapper around a standard 3D library called 3JS. And uh, you notice that not only do we have a 3D graph here, but uh, this little point is following a mouse and telling me my 3D point. So again, this 3D point's being sent back to Python. I can act on it however I want. Here I just print it out. Or if I double click, it can save the value that I clicked on. And so I get a lot of uh, interactivity with any sort of 3D plot, and I can explore this 3D plot. And of course, once you have 3D plotting, everyone wants to see the Grand Canyon. Here's a Grand Canyon. Um, but, you know, can't see it very good. And so, well, we can try to change the camera here, pretend like we're in a flight. So I'm going to change the camera. I'm going to fly this plane here. Okay, so I'm going to change the pitch and change the roll here. Okay, oh, now I've got to change the pitch a little bit less, or maybe back the other way. Ah. And see, this is what's really happening a lot of times when we're doing computations. Oh, my roll, it's got to be 0.3 instead. And so we end up, I mean, here's our insight. Here's our Here's what we want to do, and we're stuck down here typing these things. And so you say, ah, if I could just work faster. Well, of course, you can. Here, we can just have a couple sliders here. And so now I can just change the role, right? 
but I still have a problem here. I can only change one variable at a time, right? The, the computer's pretty limited. Well, you know, people have thought about this and solved this a long time ago. And you talk to any 16-year-old and you say, if you, want to, if you want to evaluate, if you want to change a, a multivariable function with seven different variables at the same time, mom, I know how to do this. I do it every day. <laughs> and so one of the nice powers that we have with the widgets is, again, we have a, uh, a generic system for getting input and acting on that input. And so here we have it, a game controller. Here I'm, I'm, I'm changing, what, 20 different variables at the same time, right? Now teenagers could probably do this a lot better than I can, but the idea is we've got an input device, and so it's easy to hook that up. Here's a text box, and I'm changing it with the input device in a couple lines of code. And of course, once you get this, you gotta say, well, those sliders up there, it's a lot easier to hook these up, and now I have, in a couple lines of code, a 3D flight simulator in Jupyter Notebook. Isn't that cool? <laughs> now, I haven't practiced well enough. <laughs> you wouldn't want to take a flight with me. But the, again, the idea is you build a system that lets you plug in parts. This is the whole idea behind Jupyter. Here, we're building a system that lets us generically hook up a controller, manage 15 variables at the same time, and an output system that needs to have 15 variables managed at the same time, and you have a very nice system. What library does that come from? Is that The question is which library it comes from. The game controller comes with, the game controller comes with IPy widgets. Uh, the browser has recently introduced an API for talking to game controllers, and so you don't have to install anything special to get the, the game controller inputs. We've had a lot of fun with this at work. <laughs> All right, so you can see that um, gaining insight by uh, being able to deal with different tool chains very effectively. Here we flip between different languages or even dealing with different languages but having the same front end helps cut down on that friction. Um, or this high level to low level context switching. The widgets allow us to stay at the high level and sort of do our computation and do our thinking as fast as we can think instead of as fast as we can type. But the insight part of Richard Hamming's thing is not just about gaining insight, it's also about giving insight. The purpose of computation is insight, not numbers. And it's not just about gaining insight, but it's also about giving insight. And so when you think about giving insight, I mean, at the end of an exploration of a scientific idea, the idea is to publish, to educate people, to communicate your ideas. And what Jupyter Notebooks allow us to do is combine explanation, computation, and interactivity all together. So the reader can understand from an explanation, see the code, they can reproduce it, and then play with things in order to gain the same sort of insight, the insight that you're trying to communicate. One of the best examples recently of this is the LIGO experiment. So a long, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, two black holes collided. And uh, there was a massive experiment uh, designed. There's two, there's two detectors. So the idea is when two black holes collide, Einstein predicted 100 years ago that that would ripple and change the very fabric of space-time, producing what we call gravity waves. And so they built some uh, uh, detectors for this sort of thing. One in Louisiana, one in uh, Washington. These are several kilometer long pipes that can measure uh, changes in distance, uh, I think up to 10 thousandths of a proton. Um, so extremely accurate detectors that detect uh, changes in distance. In the, and so they have two, uh, two arms that are at right angles to each other. And the idea is when a gravity wave passes through them that it will change one arm different than it changes the other arm, and so the actual length, the, the fabric of space-time is stretched, and you can detect that one arm is, is a little bit longer than the other arm. And so uh, they did this, and they, they put it online. They didn't really even, I think, have it up online officially, like for reals, and they got a signal, an amazing like, coincidence or, or luck here, and they got a signal almost right away, and, and the signal matched theory 
So I think black here is the, the theory, the signal match theory almost perfectly for two black holes colliding and stretching and uh, stretching and compressing space-time. So the cool thing about this is uh, they published all of the data and all of the graphs and all of the computation so that you can experiment with it yourself uh, in IPython. So here it is right here. Here's an IPython notebook and some, the sample data and you can see there's the graph that you can see and you can reproduce their computation right here. And they got all the explanations and the cool graphs and there it is, the two black holes colliding and they're able to communicate this very easily and effectively in a way that the public can understand or the public can play with the data uh, using the Jupyter Notebooks. In fact, out of this they got, here's the sound of two black holes colliding. Again, this is, this is published uh, so that people can, can gain insight from it that, that you know, your next brilliant 16-year-old or your 50-year-old, whatever that wants to play with this data or whoever wants to play with this data uh, can play with the data. So it's not just about gaining insight, it's also about communicating insight. And this is one of the best examples, I think, recently of a major groundbreaking discovery uh, that uh, was published using Jupyter Notebooks. Well, it's not just LIGO. Um, there's a whole ecosystem for publishing uh, computations and publishing Jupyter Notebooks. Um, part of the, the center part of this ecosystem is the Jupyter Notebook format. Um, and there's lots of ways to uh, put stuff into the Jupyter Notebook format. Jupyter Notebook format, uh, there's the front ends like the Jupyter Notebook that let you uh, iterate on these things. And then there's a, a program that will take the Jupyter Notebook format and convert it to a number of different uh, formats, including HTML web pages, uh, to just pure Python, to blogs, to wikis, to books, etc. cetera. Um, NB Viewer is one of these ways of looking at the Jupyter Notebook format. So this is a program. You can go to NB Viewer. I think it's nbviewer.org. Um, and there's tons of examples of Jupyter Notebooks out there. And you can view them very easily. Um, GitHub also now renders uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So if you see any notebooks on GitHub, you can click on it and you'll see a rendered version of it. And it really is uh, bringing to fruition this idea that the Jupyter Notebook can be a uh, a method for delivering these insights to, to all over the world. Um, papers have been written using Jupyter Notebooks. Again, the idea is combining explanation and computation and interactivity. Um, these papers uh, can use VMs to be able to execute the code. Um, blogs have been written using Jupyter Notebooks, and so these are different uh, blogs, uh, Scientific American, um, there's been several courses that have been written using Jupyter Notebooks as the primary method of, or, or, a, or a, uh, a secondary method for uh, uh, giving information. So for example, here's a, a really fantastic uh, book on numerical methods uh, written entirely using Jupyter Notebooks and you know the code, you have text and then you'll have code and you can just execute it right there and, and play with uh, the examples that they're mentioning in the text. Um, there's a number of books. Uh, you can download and execute the books locally. Uh, there's a gallery. If you search for uh, IPython gallery, you'll come up with this web page. And uh, there's tons and tons and tons of notebooks with all sorts of fun stuff. If you ever have a second and you want to find some cool scientific fact or whatever, go, go look at this stuff. There's some really fantastic notebooks here. Um, Nature uh, had an article about uh, reproducing uh, scientific experiments. It's one of the big issues uh, facing science these days is that uh, for a long time people have been doing computations and whatever, but they were in MATLAB or whatever, and some grad student locked in some room in some dungeon somewhere, you know, writing this code and that out pops this number and it's the result and we put it in our paper and that's it. Um, but being able to reproduce that is, is becoming much more of a concern now in, in scientific circles and so having a notebook format, having some way of giving an explanation and code um, to be able to reproduce experiments, computation experiments is extremely important. Question? 
Yeah, you actually you said that uh, they ran into the head of the best call at my best now. Oh, for a while. Um, do you support SAS in, in that same uh, Do you support any other languages in that lab, Stata? Do you support, or is it just Python? Yeah, the question is, what, what languages do we support? And I'll answer that by just looking up uh, Jupyter kernels. Kernels is the key magic word here. Uh, here we are. Here's a list of the kernels that we have. And most of these are uh, community contributed. Um, I don't know if SAS or Stata are on there. Oh, was it? Yeah, these are varying levels of uh, maturity and contributed by the community. What we've, what we've noticed is as we make these tools available, so these are tools that you can plug together and work well with each other, um, and then make the protocols openly available and, and public, that the community has come in and produced tons and tons of add-ons to the notebook or libraries like DQplot or kernels, um, like tons of these kernels that you see here. And so what we see is the ecosystem is just rapidly expanding. Mm -hmm. So you work for Bloomberg. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly, Bloomberg does a whole lot of financial research. Uh, yeah. Are you using Jupyter for any of your to talk about? Yeah. So the example I showed. So the question is, does Bloomberg use Jupyter anywhere? I'm sure there's lots that I can't talk about. But what I can talk about is the example I showed you um, earlier. That was from Daniel Lamb in the Quant Finance Research Group. So we find Jupyter as a as a very interesting, a, a good way to explore data. And, and explore different ideas for how to model finance and uh, financial models and things like that. Yeah? So if we wanted to, we to download all of these kernels that we want to use separately? Uh-huh. Yeah, there's download and install instructions, I assume, that are different for different kernels. Yeah. For the export, can you export to LaTeX? Um, I, so the question is, can you export to LaTeX? I'm, yes, I'm sure you can. Uh, there were some people asking about it the other day, uh, asking about some, some details with the conversion. There's also a LaTeX cell magic. Uh, a LaTeX what? Cell magic. Oh, yeah. So you can also put LaTeX inside of your notebook uh, using one of these percent percent, like we had the percent percent Julia. Um, another nice thing that have come out of the community, this is from, I think, Jeremy Freeman. Uh, the binder pro project. So you saw the LIGO example before. Basically what this allows you to do is uh, take any GitHub repo and uh, package it, package, package up uh, a computation of Drupal notebook and some data, etc. And what this does is it'll spin up uh, a free server that lets anybody in the world play with it. So the LIGO example that you saw me, me pointing to the other uh, a few minutes ago was a binder. Um, essentially what it was was a free uh, computation resource that was spun up with the, with the, uh, with the relevant notebooks and data are prepackaged already in there. So you can try it just by clicking on a link. Um, O'Reilly's been using uh, Jupyter Notebook in various contexts uh, for publication. Um, dashboards, so again, this is something that came out of the community. Um, this is a project uh, that, that uh, is being sponsored by IBM. Um, it allows you to take a notebook, click a button, and take these outputs and arrange them however you want. So drag and drop the outputs to make a little dashboard, and then click another button and uh, serve this dashboard up so as a sort of a web app. So you take your notebook, there's your computation, your outputs have widgets, et cetera, in them. You drag them out around however you want, press another button, and it uploads it as a web app from a public server. Um, another, there's, there's tons of other community projects. This is just a, scratching the surface here. Uh, indexing notebooks, searching notebooks, executing and, and dealing with this transition of notebooks to library code, which is something that we're still exploring. Um, we have different front ends that are being explored. Uh, we have different interactivity solutions. So here's a matplotlib uh, sort of interactivity solution, BQplot as well. Boca is another example of a library that's exploring how to do interactivity with graphics. Um, but one of the exciting things that we've been working on for the last, uh, okay, never mind, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, another thing that came out of the ecosystem is running a, a multi-user hub for a Jupyter Notebook. So you, for example, you, on UC Berkeley campus, you want all your students to be able to do computations. How do you have them all log in uh, to the system and each get their own notebook. 
Uh, Jupiter Hub has is, is been a, a community-driven project for this. Um, it's being used at UC Berkeley, and uh, they have automatic grading hooked into it, and all sorts of things. Um, yeah, here's the UC Berkeley uh, system. So Jess Hamrick is the person sort of really spearheading this, and, and a several other people from the community uh, dealing with how do you host multi-user uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Um, here's, here's one of the exciting things that I've been working on a lot with uh, several folks from Continuum, and that is uh, a new front end to the Jupyter Notebook. So what we've seen is the notebook is great for sort of a single page uh, you know, computations and, and explanations, but what a lot of people pine for is something much more like an IDE. I want to have my code editor, I want to have my notebook, and I want to have panes, and I can drag these around however I want, split up my, uh, split up my workspace, I want to have my terminal and my file browser, and I want everything to be really composable, and so I can write my own plugin to have my own visualization and my own panel somewhere in here with, uh, you know, my own resources that, that I that I want to expose. And so uh, this is uh, called Jupyter Lab, and uh, we're working hard on it. We've got uh, sort of very pre-alpha level uh, software right now, but we hope over the next few months to the next year that uh, this will be coming out in, as, as part of the Jupyter Notebook and then eventually uh, supplanting the Jupyter Notebook, uh, Jupyter Lab. So you can see here we're dragging, uh, dragging panels around. We've got a terminal, we've got our notebook, we've got widgets. You can imagine things like dragging, taking a widget here and dragging it and becoming its own panel and then rearranging the panels however you want. Um, um, again, a pre, pre, alpha version, everything's up on GitHub. Um, here's, here it is running somewhere in here. Have it running. There we are. Yeah, so here it is running on my computer. So yeah, definitely available. And uh, we welcome contributors. Um, new terminal, I guess in the commands, new terminal. Varying levels of bugginess. Right now, <laughs> right now I think there's a bug that's affecting uh, my particular computer. But anyway, yep, new terminal. And just want to mention a uh, shout out to the team. It's grown far beyond Fernando Perez. Um, here's just a lot of people that spend a lot of time, but there's also some you know huge tail of 400 some odd uh, contributors and. We'd like you to be one of the next crew <laughs> contributing if you'd like. The point is behind open source software is that uh, anybody that wants to can contribute. We're, we have Jupyter days that help people come up to speed, et cetera. Um, credits for, I think, Matthias particularly for uh, a lot of the slides here as well as Fernando. Um, Daniel Lamb, Sylvan Corley was the one that wrote the flight simulator and was spearheaded a lot of BQ plot. Uh, the Jupiter team, Carol Willing, also provided uh, a picture in these slides. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We've been taking questions all the way through. We might have, uh, okay. Is the, uh, the thing that you were demoing, is that available? Uh, which, which thing I was demoing? The one that, well, the one that led up to the completely awesome flight simulator <laughs> Xbox thing. <laughs> yes, actually, there's a binder for that. Uh, Thank you. Let's see. Fly binder Sylvan Corlay. That should pull it up. So you go to this GitHub and you click launch this binder, and uh, and the binder will spin it up and and you'll have a an active uh, instance of the WebGL flight simulator. Is there an assumption that data is static or like I'm thinking for like video processing in real time, is that something that can happen where data is changing from sure. outside events? Sure, yeah, totally. All right, 
it sounds, sounds like uh, we're out of time for questions, but thank you very much. And I'm happy to talk to whoever uh, outside the room afterwards. <laughs>